All right. Hi, Floss Tube. This is Trisha Wilson Nguyen, and this is another episode of Stories Behind the Needlework. Now, why am I wearing an Indiana Jones hat? Well, just wanted to let you know that we're getting ready to go on the archaeological dig about Nuremberg samplers. And um, I was realizing the other day, after watching some behind the scenes of uh, some Indiana Jones movies, that I was obviously, as a young child, very inspired by, by Indiana Jones and the interest in going places and digging up history. And so I thought I would wear my Indiana Jones hat today. But we'll take that off so I can get closer to the sampler. You see the sampler here. So what's the subject for today? Well, I told you in a couple episodes that we're going to need to talk a little bit about this sampler here before I jet off to Germany. So this episode, I'm going to talk about um, this sampler. About I'm going to kind of recap a few of the things that we learned in the other episode about Nuremberg in preparation because it kind of helps understand the storyline. And um, but first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about a project that is coming up soon. And I thought you might enjoy seeing it because I just finished it yesterday. I just finished this little project right here. I don't know if you can see that pretty well. This is going to be called Martha's Rose, and it is inspired by Martha Edlin's Polychrome Sampler, and it's part of something I'm announcing uh, next floss tube, which is, I'll just give you a little hint, a mini course on Martha Edlund. So, and this is part of it. So stay tuned, watch for that, keep subscribing so you can find out about more of those types of things. So let's talk about Nuremberg samplers and German samplers. And we had a whole cast of characters that we talked about last time because I had gotten, if you remember, and I'm going to put this up here like this so you can see it on my nice little board. It's a little difficult to hold up a, a, a sampler like this, but this is a 1680 Nuremberg sampler, and it's by Clara Sabina Kress von Kressenstein. And this really started my journey. Um, I, it, it came with a whole bunch of papers, if you remember, about Clara and her family and some suppositions about who may have been her teacher. And those led to other names, interesting people. And here I'll show you even closer so you can take a, take a look. The, um, just so if you don't remember, here I'll turn it over. The, Sampler is worked with a kind of counted cross stitch, which gives you a reasonably uh, similar cross stitch on the back so that it looks almost reversible if they do it very neatly. But so Clara, the one cool thing, and I'm put Clara way over here now. Clara, if you remember, look. We know what she looks like because she was part of the patrician families in Nuremberg. And I, I think the camera can't tell whether or not it wants to focus on me or her face. <laughs> so I'll put it in front of my face. But um, Clara was a part of the patrician families and her husband became the mayor of Nuremberg. Well, there was some possibilities that a woman named Rosina Helena first who published pattern books, maybe could have been her teacher, or at the very least, were pretty positive that Rosina's and her father, who was the, one of the publishers um, of Rosina's works, and then her and her mother and her sisters published after he died, um, published all these pattern books. And I'll show you this right here. These flowers show up on, on um, Clara's um, a sampler. Here, I'll show it again. You see these little motifs here, 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 and here. Those are definitely from this pattern right here, which is pretty exciting to see the patterns, as well as this right here. That is on, um, on Clara's uh, a sampler. I have a samp another sampler that has this particular pattern on it. These flower pots. 
Oh my God, all these flower pots. And this one right here shows up on other samplers of that time frame. And of course we have all the lovely Catholic iconography. So Rosina. Now Rosina, if you look her up, a lot of people like to write that Rosina was taught as well as her sister by a woman named Maria Sibylia Miriam Graffin, who moved to Nuremberg and was definitely doing something in regards to embroidery, had a little school, and they report that, um, that Maria was Rosina's teacher, except <laughs> that Rosina was seven years older than Maria, so that's not so likely. But I think her sister may have been. Um, her t but we have to continue to look in that and figure out who's saying that. Um, have to investigate that more. So, Maria. We have a picture of Maria as a young woman right about the time that she is in, is in Nuremberg. And Maria Sibylia Miriam Graffin is very famous because she was a early botanist. Um, she was an entomologist. She was, she's listed as being the first entomologist. And you can actually see, I mean, these actually, this, is, this is when she was in Amsterdam later on in her life. And this is in Nuremberg um, earlier in her life. But if she was the teacher, like some people have said too, you might expect her pattern books to be very much like my Clara's sampler. Well, I told you that I had happened to have her book of New Book of Flowers that was published while she was in Nuremberg and was supposedly a pattern book for embroidery. And there are many beautiful florals in here. And you do start to see things that are going to remind us of things that we see on embroidered samplers over there, as well as I think there is some uh, nice Let's see. Well, we definitely see this motif kind of here where they're tied with a ribbon. That seems to be quite popular in her works. But they don't look exactly like, I think there was a, there we go. They don't look exactly like the, um, uh, the sampler right here. Now, this sampler right here was actually worked, the, the grouping of them were worked from 1704 to 1740. And with all the ones that are dated like this, that look like this. And guess what? She had moved on already from Nuremberg and was off to South America drawing pictures of South American bugs. So not so likely that she is the teacher of these types of samplers. So we'll put this aside. But I did just get this wonderful book right here which is a, um, a book which is about the symposium that was held about Maria Sibylia Miriam, and obviously bug, <laughs> big time known for her bugs and her bug drawings and studies. And, and she was the first person to actually document the metamorphosis of a silkworm. A lot of people had some strange ideas of that at that time. But um, this is a great book, and inside of it are two wonderful articles. This is, if you're interested more in her, then I suggest getting this. This is out on the market at the moment, so it's some good haul. So Christine Sauer wrote an article about painting flowers with needles, and she happens to be the librarian at the Nuremberg City Museum so guess what typey, 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 little emails, and I got a little farther, and there's a book that I have to go get. I cannot order it and get it shipped to me from Nuremberg. I physically have to walk into the library and buy it. And it's an exhibition that they held about Maria and embroidery. So I'm really interested in that. But anyways, there are a lot of, um, there are autograph books. And these autograph books have embroideries which look like they came from Maria's work. And she also was known, here's, a, here's another embroidery right there. She was known to have, oh, this is fascinating right here. This wreath right here, that is a silk paper that is used on embroidered caskets at the same time period in England. And it's been cut up into little pieces and glued down in, not a surprise, these wreaths of flower kind of look. So, I mean, there is, there's something there, definitely, there's something there. Um, 
And then there is this wonderful um, other article by another researcher who tracks the um, instances of Maria Sibelia Marian's drawings and paintings in autograph books of men of Nuremberg. And, um, and so she, she is definitely known to have done these because she signed them. So there's a lot of information in this book. I've been combing through it. Well, there is another cast of characters to add to the mix. There is a woman named Margaretha Mainberg Hellman. She grew up near Nuremberg. I gotta read some of these little details to get the dates right, you know. Um, she grew up near Nuremberg and she uh, was born in 1659. She's known to have been there in 1695 because she married somebody then. Um, no, I, I, I'm going to take that back. I have to go back and look at look that particular piece up. But she's known to have been there by 1695. And she publishes three pattern books in Nuremberg. I don't know if she came to Nuremberg earlier and it's not documented and was a student of Maria Sibelia Miriam's in the little school that she had. She's the right age. She could have done that. Uh, but yet, yet there's no documentation of it. But um, she published three pattern books in Nuremberg. V&A has all three. And there are lovely patterns for multiple pieces of clothing as well as for linens. But let's start to look at the pattern books pages with respect to my sampler, which is known to have been from Nuremberg. So let's start with the first one right here. Oh my goodness, not only do we have these very realistic looking flower um, wreaths like we did in Miriam's book, but we have these kind of stylized wreaths like kind of the folk stylization that you've got going on here in the wreath on my piece. You have lovely little um, florals with uh, the ribbon tied on it, and you have these garlands of flowers with the ribbons at the tops. And I don't know if you how well you can see it, and I will try to hold it closer so you can to the camera. But can you see the drawing on this? That is right here in this unfinished area. That is a garland done in tent stitch and unfinished of fruit with the two sides having the bows on it. So what do we got going on here? Let's take a look at some more of the pictures from her pattern books. Here we go. We have these types of vases with the flowers in it, just like on my piece and more garlands. And then, yes, there they are, the fruit garlands with the ribbons on them. And mine is between this one and this one in terms of how it looks, which is really interesting. We also have more of these floral um, bouquets with the small ribbons around them in her book. And we have cross-stitch patterns, which look surprisingly similar to the cross-stitch patterns here and at the top. And I'll, I'll pick this up and take it so you can take a really good look at this. Let's see here. Uh, can you see that cross stitch pattern there? I mean, that looks a lot like that graph. It's not exactly, but it's, it's stylistically very similar to it. These, uh, the frames are hard, they're heavy. <laughs> so I, I've got this to hold a little easel to hold this up. And then we have, well, these kind of borders, which look like this embroidered border on the side. Very interesting. And then you have these, this um, garden scene here with the women that with the, you know, the little lambs and, and the nice uh, um, fountain. Well, Margaretha Hellman did scenes for things as well. And it's quite possible, you know, when you start taking this whole body of work together, you start going, hmm, possibly a student 
of Miriam because the work looks very similar to Miriam's work. But maybe because she's listed as being an embroidery teacher, this Margaretha Hellman, maybe she was the teacher of these particular pieces and drew the patterns on the linen. Well, the next thing, you know, I had to kind of start thinking about was, well, when was she active? When was she in Nuremberg? Because she grew up near Nuremberg, but, and then, but did she, you know, was she there when these samplers, when all of them with the dates on them are known to have been worked? Well, the dates of these were 1704 to 1740, and she started working and living there in 1695 and died in 1742. So unless we find a sampler like this that is outside of that date range, that might be our teacher, our teacher and our designer of these particular samplers, which are just outstanding. And not, unfortunately, the famous entomologist. But maybe the famous entomologist had a little role in these things um, getting done. Now there's one more woman. Actually, there's three or four more, but you know, one more that's kind of important in this. And that is Emilia Baron. And Emilia Baron is also a pattern maker, and I'm having difficulty getting some uh, pictures of her patterns. I've seen some of them, and they're similar to this, um, to this, this sampler's work here, a lot of this floral. So, um, but she was the daughter of Johann, um, I hope I get it pronounced right, uh, Pachelbel, the composer the famous composer. She was born in a nearby town of Erfurt, and there's actually a plaque on the house that she was born in, which says that she was the author of the first knitting pattern book. So it's like, whoa, we have, I mean, start to think about this. We have now four, four, and there's actually two more, but four, because I haven't seen the designs of the other two, uh, four women who are known to have been drawing needlework patterns in Nuremberg in the 17th century and a little bit to the, to the 18th century, so much, and, and, and so well known enough that several of them actually have portraits. I mean, portraits made of a woman of that time. This had to be engraved in copper. Why would somebody do that for an embroidery teacher? That's, that's kind of the question, right? Um, so, much of what we know about these women was written after, written around 1730, um, after their deaths, because they are um, included in a Encyclopedia of Important Mathematicians and Artists of Nuremberg by a man named Doppelmayr. So I have to obviously hunt down this book and take a look at it. I don't know if this is the only mention of some of these women and that that's where all the locus of some of this information comes from. I mean, clearly we actually have the pattern books for some of them, so we do have other information in those books. But um, it's kind of interesting <laughs> that there is this just locus of, of women who are designing embroidery and teaching embroidery and publishing and are supposedly so famous that they are mentioned in this particular book. So I wanted to give you kind of this cast of characters. I mean, there's a few more embroiderers that I haven't mentioned, you know, because I don't know exactly their first names. I know their family names from their coat of arms on the pieces. But let's take a look deeper into this sampler and these types of samplers, because they are not like my Clara, my Clara's sampler, because this is pretty much, oh, get this. This is pretty much just a reversible a double-sided cross stitch over the entire thing. It's beautiful, I love it, it's fresh. Um, I really enjoy the motifs and the story behind this girl. And she was very young when she did this. But these samplers are some of the types of samplers that I have just loved forever because they have things on them that are very interesting from technique. And now I'm going to bring this forward here. And I think I'll probably, because of the lights on it, I'm probably going to put a nice picture overlay right now so that you can see it um, up close. OK. 
Okay, so now you've seen it look kind of like all in one. So let's take a look at this more carefully. I really have loved these types of samplers because of these little blocks at the bottom, which have all of these like Florentine slash, you know, flame stitch type patterns because they're worked in filament silk. And when they're worked in filament silk, when you move across them, and let me see if I can do this, if I can show you really up close how when you, you hold it up and then you move the silk just, you know, the coloration changes and it shines. It's really hard for the camera, I know, to, to get the, um, but hopefully you can see that. And those little squares, some of them like the one on the, on the corner way over here is just absolutely gorgeous. I really want to do that like as a little project maybe. Maybe you can put some comments down um, on whether or not you'd be interested in any of these little squares as little projects. But um, let me quickly go over the stitches in them and then I will show you more. You know, as I go, I'll show you some really close pictures of them because it's, it's kind of hard to see with lights in the room and it's really tiny and, and I really like to see embroidery up close. But actually look at that. Look at when you turn this, the, the, the satin stitch right here, this is all long and short stitch. Look at how the, 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 the light play off of the filament silk. It's just beautiful. I mean, really, really, it's beautiful. And, and that's why I kind of had to have it. And then when I found out, not only was it something that I was kind of like in love with as, as a, just a stitching, you know, and, and, and how it shows the light off of the filament silk. But when I found it was at Nuremberg, I was like, oh, I have to have that. So um, let's start over here. This one is my favorite because of the little tiny short stitches, which are used with the long stitches. And um, I really like that. And it's not actually a pure satin stitch. You reverse your stitches here and there in it. So that's really fascinating. This is a rice stitch right here that makes this beautiful ombre look to a, um, uh, to, to a weaving pattern. This one right here is another Florentine or a flame stitch type piece. And it has, it, it has, and I'll, I'll show you a nice picture of it. It's a little something weird there where it's kind of, instead of being a satin stitch, it's changing its direction. So it kind of goes, you go down to up and then up to down, back and forth. And that's what gives you that, um, that look to it. And get another thing that maybe, maybe we should do as a little project. What do you think? Then we have this little one right here. And this is surprisingly interesting as well. If you turn it, look at the shine off of that silk. And that is just satin stitches in different directions that gives that look. Then we have a, um, at the end, the motifs are really cute. Um, this little, uh, kind of like a carnation um, uh, pattern in cross stitch. Put this down here. We have another, um, you know, flame stitch, satin stitch type um, work here. Then this has some degradation to it because of the iron mordant that was used in the black, but that is tent stitch. And oh my God, that is the smallest tent stitch you've ever seen. It's like, it's like you know, getting silk gauze and doing, and doing tent stitch at around 70 count. That's about that. I haven't done a count on this linen here, but it's about that scale. Then we have another um, type of flame stitch here. We have queen stitch. Then 
Then we have another satin stitch type um, motif here. But notice that some of the, these are all in color families, meaning that you have not a pink and a yellow and a green um, and a blue, but you have shaded families. So you have like four blues, four pinks, four yellows. And that makes this particular sampler much more expensive than a lot of the kind of samplers that you, um, that you see uh, reproduced today because you don't need a full range of the color family uh, to do it. And then at the far end, you have two more satin stitch type um, uh, pieces. We have this long and short area in the middle. And then not a surprise that this stitcher did not, I mean, think about it, this whole thing is finished, but she didn't finish this. This is 10 stitch. She'd already done this little piece right here and knew how much work it was, but <laughs> look at how much 10 stitch there is there. At a, and you know, if it's, let's say if it's just 60 count, that's 360 uh, stitches per inch. That's an amazing amount of work. And yeah, she didn't finish it. Um, and you can kind of see why. Up here you have satin stitch and you have way over here satin stitch. Um, it's kind of a coordinating um, uh, wreath and band. You have over here cross stitch for the jar and the bottom band and I don't know if you can see it, the top band are also cross stitch. And then we have, look over here, this. My, my finger, or my, no, no, my finger's not, there it is. My finger's right now. Um, this particular motif here is done in a goblin stitch. So that's a short vertical satin stitch. Um, and uh, the entire thing is done in that. And I really have not seen that before, but all of the samplers of this type have a, um, have a motif on one side that is worked this way. And it's kind of hard to think about it, you know, it, can you graph that? I, I don't think so. I think that they probably drew it, and I saw drawings underneath um, this one. Uh, I think they drew it on the fabric, and then they just started filling it in, but with a stitch that's like, that's like you know, over uh, three units um, instead of over one unit. And uh, I, I, I kind of, if you're interested, you know, but again, you know, put some comments in there. That might be a really interesting project to try with some filament silk for maybe a little teaching project or something. So give me some ideas of things like that. And I, of course, I've been showing you pictures that uh, I've taken up close. Now we have a much better feeling. This is, this is a much more complicated uh, work than um, the piece that Clara did. Maybe it's by, maybe this is like the second piece that a girl did, you know, she did her kind of more marking sampler like Clara's and then something like this afterwards. So maybe you're talking about a slightly older girl um, uh, doing a piece like this. Maybe it's Margarita, um, Margaretha's, uh, oh God, get that right, name right. Uh, maybe it's uh, Frau Helms, <laughs> Helmans uh, work. Uh, as a teacher, or at least as a draftsperson for the, um, for the pieces. It's time for us to jet over to Germany now to go on this archeological hunt for some of the materials we need to understand um, about Nuremberg, about the different families that are going, that are there. Uh, get the book from the city library on their exhibition about Miriam Sibelia, um, um, Maria Sibelia and Miriam and uh, her relationship to embroidery and see if there's answers there as well. But um, we have uh, an interesting uh, detective hunt in front of us. And if you like this kind of content, please follow me um, on YouTube and uh, upcoming more Travels with Trisha.